With the closure of molecular biology begins our study of evolution. Here is a review of chapter 22 of Campbell Biology on Darwinian Natural Selection, which is the start of Unit 7 in AP Biology. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Biology related content. In today's review, we will begin our study of the evolution unit, which ultimately ties together so many concepts that we've covered thus far. This chapter is largely divided into two major themes. First is the history of ideas that led up to Darwin's development of his theory of natural selection. And the second is going into the mechanisms of natural selection itself. We'll focus on both topics today because even the history and some of the major thinkers that influenced Darwin have been seen on this AP biology exam and certainly could be part of your school exam. Chapter 22.1 begins by exploring the ideas of life's biodiversity. The first great thinker we talk about here is Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher. While Aristotle is still renowned for many of his great contributions to philosophy, it seemed that his biology game was kind of weak. In his view, species as he knew it then were fixed or unchanging. He thought of living things as being perfect, which could be organized by complexity through what he called the scala naturae. And to be honest, we can't really blame him too much. It wasn't like there was much traveling back then, and there were certainly no videos or photographs to observe organisms across space and time. And even for centuries following, the world mostly agreed on this idea of fixedness of species, which was further buttressed by the advent and the rise of Christianity around the world. Because if you're like me and attended Sunday school as a kid, we're familiar with the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis, which, allegorically or not, describes the creation of all living things as they were and as they are. But these ideas were beginning to be challenged by the development of our societies and even technology. Digging into sedimentary rocks, we begin to discover a myriad of fossils, which, incidentally, contain remnants of species that look nothing like what we see around us today. Further, these fossils were found in strata or layers of rocks that we now know would have taken millions of years to gradually form. And here we meet the father of paleontology, Georges Cuvier. And while his contribution to the field was amazing, Cuvier, in his resistance to the idea of an ancient planet, advocated a theory that we should be familiar with catastrophism. This theory was largely a rationalization of why such strata existed in our rock formations. Cuvier argued that unlike modern times, early history of our planet was plagued with particular catastrophes that could explain why sudden and abrupt changes in the rock formations existed. As an example, a catastrophe like the flood. So you can kind of see where Cuvier is coming from. Yet science would eventually prevail with James Hutton and later Charles Lyell who would offer a more rational explanation through the proposal of uniformity a principle that would support the idea that the strata formed through slow and gradual processes, simultaneously insinuating that the Earth could potentially be millions, if not billions of years old. And so far, we've already pointed out two major factors that potentially had influenced Darwin's thinking. One, perhaps life's diversity was not so fixed after all, and two, the Earth could potentially be very old. Of course, Darwin wouldn't be the only person contemplating these ideas. In the late 18th century, a French biologist by the name of Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck would get pretty close to the right idea of how species evolve, but miss it by a smidgen. And while his theory was incorrect, it's worthwhile noting it here. Lamarck proposed that organisms could change due to something he called acquired inheritance. And the idea was simple. Changes incurred during the lifetime of an organism were then passed down to its offspring. For instance, a giraffe stretching its neck to reach for a higher leaf on a tree canopy could give rise to more giraffes now with slightly elongated next because of what its parents did. This, as we'll see, isn't quite how all this works because the fact that I get a bunch of tattoos in my lifetime isn't going to give rise to the coolest baby in the world. But it was an important moment in biology because Lamarck's work paved the way for people to begin thinking about how species could change over time due to natural mechanisms. Moving on to 22.2, we begin discussing a bit of Darwin's biography, that he was always interested in nature and collecting beetles, and that while he began studying medicine, he pivoted to theology before being recommended to being a naturalist on a voyage around the world on a survey ship called the HMS Beagle. And while this history might might be a bit boring for diehard scientists like you guys. Just wait, because this is the section that uncovers the mechanics of natural selection. But back to a bit more history here. As you can see, the journey was long and wide, beginning in Great Britain and essentially traversing all the major oceans. Where we want to focus on, however, is the Galapagos Islands, where Darwin would make majority of his observations that led to the development of his theory. What's important to note here is the initial goal of Charles Darwin. 
He was interested in explaining the various adaptations he observed in different organisms around the world. Now, these adaptations, of course, are features that allow an organism or a species to survive in its environment, such as the big ears that dissipate heat in desert foxes. And while the common consensus among most people during his time was that a creator crafted these adaptations, thus allowing these organisms to thrive in their environments, Darwin wanted to know if there was perhaps a naturalistic explanation for the existence of these adaptations. Now, many of you may be familiar with Darwin's finches, whose beaks and head shapes differ based on the different types of environments in which they lived. And while these finches are interesting, I think it's more important to focus on how Darwin would reason out his theory of evolution at a more fundamental level. First, we need to acknowledge that by the time Darwin began contemplating the source of these adaptations, there were several facts that were widely known. For one, domestication efforts throughout history had already shown us that organisms could in fact change, like how broccoli, cauliflower, flour and all the foods that we disliked as kids stemmed from a single starter species. And while it wouldn't be for some decades until Mendel would describe how inheritance actually worked, these ideas were fairly well known. Another idea which was mentioned earlier was that the earth could potentially be very, very old, meaning that slow and gradual processes could happen in biology too. With these foundations, Darwin only needed to make a couple of observations and inferences to come to his theory of evolution by natural selection. So let's take a look. Observation number one, members of a population often vary in their inherited traits. Okay, so this one goes without saying. Sitting in your class, you'll notice that everyone has a distinct set of attributes, whether it be their looks, personality, or even interests. Variation is guaranteed to exist within populations. So even if we're talking about finish, we're certain to find differences among individuals for almost every parameter that we measure. Observation number two, all species produce more offspring than the environment can support, and many fail to survive and reproduce. Now, this one may not be so obvious within our species, but that's because we work really hard and viciously to take ourselves out of that food web. But imagine for a moment that you're born as a worm tomorrow. You might have two goals, eat and don't get eaten. It's a brutal world out there in the arena of selection. So it goes without saying that there is a struggle for survival in nature. Now, based on these two observations, Darwin was able to come to two major inferences. First was that those individuals whose inherited traits provided an advantage in survival would have a higher probability of reproducing while those with relatively worse traits would die before reproducing. Second was that if, in fact, traits are inherited from one generation to the next, then those with favorable traits who are better at surviving and reproducing would leave behind more offspring with those traits that would accumulate in the population over time. So let's take an example for a moment. Suppose that in a population of rabbits living in northern Canada, they have fur coats that vary from brown to slightly less brown all the way to white. Now that is what we call variability. Now we all know that many of the rabbits who are born would die before reaching sexual maturity, and even if they do, nothing would guarantee their successful reproduction. That, of course, would be that struggle for survival. With those conditions set, imagine that in a particularly snowy winter, the fields are packed with white snow. That, for this population of rabbits, would selectively advantage whiter rabbits over darker rabbits. There would be a higher probability that a rabbit with a lighter coat would hide better from predators and survive to leave more babies behind. And because fur coat color is heritable, the next generation of rabbits would have greater proportions of individuals who have lighter coat than the generation before. Now, in this scenario, the environment with its white snow acts as a selectional force that, much like the artificial selection, would screen the passage of genes, allowing only those who are more fit in that environment to survive and reproduce. This is natural selection, and what Darwin was able to conclude here was that natural selection could absolutely be the mechanism to explain adaptations. As we've just seen, the environment or nature acts as a selector of traits that over time would become more and more and more in tune with what is necessary to survive. To take the desert fox we've mentioned before as an example, the brilliance lies in that Darwin saw through what we call the selection bias, which means that instead of thinking of desert foxes as simply having big ears because that was what was meant to be, his claim was that sure, there were many foxes of varying ear sizes, but the ones with smaller ears never survived, only leaving behind what appears to be suited to the climate 
as a matter of what's simply left behind. But before we get too ahead of ourselves here, let's keep a few things in mind that are very helpful for this course. One is that natural selection does not have an end goal or a direction which it seeks, meaning that as environments change, so do favorable traits. It's not always going to be the case that white rabbits would be better because in winters where temperature is warm, dark rabbits may prevail. Second is that natural selection drives change to the population and not the individual. This means that if a rabbit is born with dark or light fur, selection would not change its fur color within its life, but rather it would either fail or succeed in reproducing and the entire population as a whole would simply see a frequency change in the rabbits with particular fur colors. Lastly, keep in mind that natural selection is only one part of the bigger picture that is evolution. It's important to keep in mind that as we prepare for the next chapter, that while natural selection is consistent in producing adaptations, there are many other mechanisms that could also drive changes within the population that we'll explore in greater detail in chapter 23. Last and not least, we have chapter 22.3, which explores evidence that buttress the theory of evolution as we understand it today. This is perhaps the section with the greatest number of terms and concepts that you'll need to know for the exam, so don't click away just yet. Now, it's generally accepted within the scientific community that the theory of evolution is on equal grounds with, say, things like theory of gravity. So how can we make such a claim? Well, let's take a look at some of the major pieces of evidence that support the theory of evolution. First, we have direct observation of evolutionary change. Here, I want to focus specifically on a particular phenomenon that should concern us even today. And I'm talking about the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria. Do you remember scratching your knee on a rusty nail and then dying? No, of course not. And that's because back in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, our first antibiotic. But the problem is that the application of the antibiotic has resulted in some bacterial strains developing what we call antibiotic resistance through the process of selection. This is a big problem because in recent years, we've seen extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is extremely difficult to treat even with a battery of antibiotics. Now, there's something here, though, that AP Biology really wants you to know, and it's the idea that the application of antibiotics do not lead to the development of resistance. Rather, random mutations among bacteria by chance had formerly produced a strain or strains that were already resistant to the antibiotic prior to the application. The idea is that selection selects from what's already there and does not create changes within existing individuals. Another great piece of evidence for evolution is called homology. Take a look at this picture for a moment. Here we see the human arm, the cat arm, leg, maybe, uh, the whale fin, and a bat wing. Notice how there is this great similarity in the number and the arrangement of bones. We have a long bone called the humerus, followed by two small bones, radius and ulna, and then carpals, metacarpals, and then phalanges. What makes this interesting can be arrived at by asking a hypothetical question. Say if these species were all individually created or designed rather than sharing a common ancestor, would there have been any reason for these bones to have these similarities? Take the whale fin, for instance, where the Humerus, radius, and ulna are pretty much all fused. There's no reason for them to exist as three instead of one. But with the theory of evolution, we could explain why this is. See, humans, cats, whales, and bats are in fact all mammals that share a mammalian ancestor. And actually, going back even further, we share a common ancestor with all of the other tetrapods, or four-legged organisms, that happen to have these structures because we got it from our ancestors. In fact, homologies even exist at the molecular level, where certain genes are shared among species due to its origins in ancestors prior. But keep in mind that while examples of the arm show different functions with homologous structures, homologies need not manifest as features that do different things. For instance, the fact that we have hemoglobin and chimpanzees have hemoglobin would still be a homologous trait between chimps and us, despite the fact that it does the same thing in both species. By the way, we see homologies rising in a type of evolution that we call divergent evolution as single species diverges into multiple species, all which which would share these homologous traits. Next, we have vestigial structures. These are features of species that don't have any great utility now, but are simply there because it was there in an ancestral species. For instance, we often refer to our tailbone as being a vestigial structure, because while we don't have a tail anymore, our ancestor, prior to the splitting of the great apes and the monkeys, did. Here too, we see molecular vestigial structures as well. For instance, because birds evolved from dinosaurs, they actually still maintain genes that could form teeth in their little beaks, though they don't express it, thankfully. Another piece of evidence we often talk about is called convergent evolution, and that forms what we call analogous structures. But here, we're taking a slightly different approach. 
Because what conversion evolution shows is the predictive nature of natural selection. That is, that natural selection simply works. Take the sugar glider and the flying squirrel, for instance. These two species do share a common ancestor, of course, but that ancestor did not have those flappity flaps underneath its arms. Rather, these features evolved independently in these two species due to similar pressures of their arboreal environments and advantages conferred by the flappity flap flaps. I can't not say that. In any case, the flaps then would be considered analogous structures because unlike homologies, they're not from the same source, but are rather analogies that evolved independently. Finally, the chapter explores fossils again, showing how gradual changes have been observed in the evolution of aquatic mammals like whales and even biogeography, which demonstrates how the distribution of species and their daughter species correlate greatly with what we know about the drifting of our continents under the theory of plate tectonics. By the way, one of the most prolific scientists in the field of biogeography was Alfred Wallace, who is actually credited with having arrived at the concept of natural selection independently from Charles Darwin. An analogous trait, am I right? <laughs> So that just about covers the entirety of chapter 22. While this chapter deals more with the history and the theoretical framework surrounding natural selection and evolution, you should strap yourself in because things are about to get much more challenging. In the next chapter, we'll even need a calculator. But anyways, as always, if you found this video useful, evolve that like button to its final form and click subscribe to stay on top of more videos just like this one. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. Have a great day. Hey!